Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Welcome to part 8 of my review of Masks of Nihilathotep for Call of Cthulhu 7th edition by Chaosium. In this video I will be covering chapter 5, Kenya. This one will be in two parts. The first part will cover the investigators arriving in Mombasa, the attack by Tarnkar, meeting the various contacts in Nairobi that they have, and finishing with a meeting with Johnston Kenyatta that leads to an audience with the tribal magician, Old Mundari. Part 2 will cover Tarnkar, the sidetrack scenario with Colonel Endicott's Lodge, the meeting with Old Bundari, and the chapter finale at the Mountain of the Black Wind. The chapter begins by reiterating that this was the final journey of the Carlisle expedition and that their journey should culminate inland at the Mountain of the Black Wind. The investigators have a chance to learn some valuable information and acquire some useful items here, and the hope is that they will chase every single lead down before heading off to the Aberdeer Forest. They may receive assistance from local tribes and a particularly powerful tribal magician, though can expect little from the colonial administration or police. Representatives of the Crown are ignorant to the menace of the Cult of the Bloody Tongue, with no white person knowing the location of the Mountain of the Black Wind, knowing it only as Mount Satima. They could pick up the trail here by following clues from Jonah Kensington in the New York chapter, using Jackson Elias's notes. This can lead them to Johnston Kenyatta, Lieutenant Mark Selkirk and Nails Nelson, in addition to Sam Mariga, Dr. Starrett, Neville German and Colonel Endicott. They can also find out that Arja Singh may also know about Moeru. Also, if they've met Jack Brady in Shanghai, then they should have a detailed map that will take them directly to the Mountain of the Black Wind. As has been mentioned throughout, the Carlisle expedition came to Kenya in 1919, alleging to go on safari in the Great Rift Valley. While there, they stayed at Hampton House and met with Neville German, who organised bearers for them and medical supplies from Dr Horace Starrett. While here, the heads of the expedition met with Tarn Kaur, a local bloody tongue cultist, who helped them get to the Mountain of the Black Wind. Within a few days, they were off, and they spent a night at Colonel Endicott's Game Lodge, which is a sidetrack scenario in this chapter. Jack Brady, becoming increasingly disgusted by Carlisle, drugged him and spirited him off to Mombasa and then on to Durban. After they fled, the remaining expedition members continued on toward the mountain and in a wilderness clearing one night sacrificed the bearers by summoning various heralds of Nihilathotep. They then continued on to the mountain where Mueru and Masters remain. Houston and Penhu travelled back to Mombasa before leaving Kenya. Months later, the massacre site was discovered by Sam Mariga, who was visiting a cousin in the village of Ndovu. He reported it to the authorities who did nothing. When Erica Carlyle decided to visit, she met with the authorities and as a result men were dispatched to the site to look for remains. They discovered the remains but found no Caucasian ones amongst them but lied about this and used that as an excuse to subjugate the local tribesfolk with the end result being that five innocent men were hanged. It gives us a timeline of what the Carlyle expedition did in Kenya as well as a map of the region and then goes into the activities of Jackson Elias while he was here. He arrived on July the 23rd, 1924, having followed leads about the Cult of the Bloody Tongue, to see if they were connected to the expedition. He tracked down Roger Corydon, who told him the official story of the fate of the expedition. However, Elias was unconvinced and headed out to the site to see for himself. When there, he noted the barren earth and the way the local tribes avoid it. He interviewed Johnston Kenyatta, who confessed that he believed that the Cult of the Bloody Tongue were responsible. He also spoke to Lieutenant Mark Selkirk, the leader of the men who discovered the massacre, who partially confirmed the official stance, but later said that no white corpses were found. Continuing on, he ran into Nails Nelson, who claimed to have seen Jack Brady alive in Hong Kong, and Elias left Mombasa following this lead on August 16th, 1924. We then move on to guidance on how to run this chapter. It says that the investigators will most likely arrive by sea to Mombasa, and they will be spied upon unless they are incredibly careful. A local cultist, Tarn Kaur, will be relentless in her pursuit and attack them at the first opportunity. More on that in a bit. They have a number of options open to them, as to where to start. They could journey to Nairobi and consult with the Nairobi Star, as well as encountering Colonel Endicott, and perhaps most importantly, they can meet up with Old Bundari, an old tribal magician who can offer them genuine assistance for the climax of the chapter at the Mountain of the Black Wind. Bear in mind that unless the investigators stop it, Hypatia Masters will give birth to the spawn of Nihilathotep. It's also entirely possible that the ritual of the birth takes place at the same time as the Grand Conjunction. We have a few pull considerations and then it moves on to arriving in Kenya. It details the various methods that the investigators could employ to get there from all of the other chapters, usually by boat, finishing in Mombasa and then it moves on to the setting information. It gives us a list of the languages that are spoken in East Africa as well as the now to be expected London Underground map of how the clues fit together and then we move on to Kenya itself. It's a geographically diverse place of dense rainforests, swamps, deserts and snow-topped mountains. 
The coast is hot and humid and the climate varies inland and has two wet seasons. The society is discriminated by skin colour due to white colonialism and generally impoverished and oppressed. It has a large Indian population. The currency is the English pound due to it being part of the British Empire and the law is almost identical to that in Britain. Social division is everywhere with black, white and Arab areas and segregation is enforced. How the keeper decides to play this out is entirely dependent on how comfortable their group are. The transport in the area is mostly the Uganda Railway and there are the usual array of cars, bicycles, camels and donkeys. Horses are not common due to insect bites and disease. Guns are quite common and widely available here and game hunters are a normal sight though a hunting licence will need to be obtained. There are three newspapers that the investigators could encounter. The East African Standard, the Mombasa Times and the Nairobi Star as well as the Kikuyu newspaper, Muigwithania. The Kenyan people are tribal in nature, with many being farmers and hunter-gatherers. The investigators are most likely to meet Swahili people and Akamada tribesfolk, as well as the possibility of the Maasai and Nandi. The cult of the bloody tongue flourishes here, with their most important and brutal rites being performed at the Mountain of the Black Wind, and they always use the African panga knife and wear hideous headpieces similar to the New York cult. They can also have tattoos and scarification to show their devotion. Tarn Kaur is an Indian tea seller who leads Nairobi's cultists. Kaur is devoted to the small crawler, an Indian aspect of Nihilathotep, and has been assimilated into the African cult, thus understanding the many forms of her foul god. Officially denied by the administration, most Kenyans are vaguely aware of the bloody tongue and detest it, though they also fear it. After this, we move on to the dramatis personae of the chapter. I'll go into these people more when we reach their relevant section in the book, but I'll provide a quick overview here. We have the potential allies. First we have Bertram Nails Nelson, a soldier of fortune who met Jackson Elias and is an alcoholic and a drug user. There's Johnston Kenyatta, a political activist and actual future president of Kenya. He was interviewed by Elias. There is Natalie Smythe Forbes, the publisher of the Nairobi Star, a well-known source of information who has a stern exterior but a kind demeanour and who is a secret spiritualist. And there is old Bundari, a great tribal magician who can help the investigators with magic and information. After this we have the adversaries. There's Tarn Kaur, a tea seller and agent of the Bloody Tongue, alongside Avtar Singh, her naive nephew, and we have Muweru, who's already been detailed a number of times previously. It also gives information on some of the minor NPCs. There's Okomu, who is old Bundari's acolyte. Arja Singh, an exporter of African art. Neville German, a barrister who is obsessed with the city of the White Gorilla. Dr Horace Starrett, an Anglican rector and MD. Sam Mariga, a gardener at the railway, an opponent of the cult of the bloody tongue, and finally Hypatia Masters, the once beautiful society girl who is now a bloated abomination, ready to give birth to the spawn of Nihilathotep. It gives us some information on how to deal with Nitocris in Kenya. Essentially, if Mueru succeeds in opening the Great Gate, Nitocris's plans cannot come to pass, and she may even offer them assistance, though should she decide to join forces with Mueru, she will be another danger to the investigators. After this, we move on to Mombasa. If they arrive from Cairo, then it's a good transition for them. It is an Arabic city with elaborate decorations, mosques, minarets and veils, a famous merchant city on the edge of the Indian Ocean. It was built on a coral island and is connected to the mainland via a railroad. When they arrive here, the investigators can, with the right role, spot the same young Indian man watching them. This is Avtar Singh, who will alert Tarn Kaur. This could lead to a chase scene if they try to capture him. It gives us the quick reference needed for the chase scene as well as some notable locations in Mombasa and then it moves on to one of the possible leads, Seeking Arja Singh. There are various ways in which the party could be aware of this, though when they look for him he is away in India due to return in three to six weeks. There's nothing in his building linking him with anything untoward and he keeps a gang of thugs to protect his business. The only thing of real interest is a lock iron safe. Should the investigators get into it, they'll find cash and various invoices in different languages that lead to some of the different factions in the book. It then details the Ugandan railway to Nairobi. It's 600 miles long and the train is segregated by class and colour detailed here. The journey takes between 15 to 18 hours and although the temperature is hot, it is less humid. The plains of Africa are gentle and rolling and around halfway Mount Kilimanjaro can be seen. If Tarn Kaur has been told of their arrival, she will board the same train and an hour before reaching Nairobi will launch an attack on the investigators by summoning two fire vampires which will cause a panic and start burning the train. They will attack until the investigators die, they are destroyed or Tarn is killed. People will start fighting the fire using the plentiful resources on board to do so. Tarn will go all out to kill them, though she will try to escape if beaten severely. 
He gives a pulp consideration which involves a fight on top of the train and shows us a map of the region. At last, the investigators should arrive in Nairobi. At this time, it is a fairly new town of around 8,000 people. Just beyond the town is the Aberdeer Range, which contains Mount Satima, the Mountain of the Black Wind. It's a generally cool and dry place with good water and excellent soil, and Indian and Muslim influences can be seen. It's mostly self-administered, but loyal to the crown, and split into three districts with the colonial racism of the period being well represented. Segregation is everywhere. The edge of the town is slums, usually populated by Swahili people. It's worth noting that in the time leading up to the ritual of the birth and the great gate opening, there'll be an increasing number of cultists in the area. Outside of Nairobi, life continues as it always has done, and the tribal cultures are stable. They're generally friendly and curious with regard to strangers. In Nairobi, English is widely spoken, and the most popular language outside of it is Swahili and a Bantu-structured trading language. Even though the tribes have their own languages, Swahili is often the common ground. It gives us some notes on British rule of Kenya and about the effect it had on how the Kikuyu people were exploited and mistreated by the British Empire, and also covers game rules for tropical disease. Essentially, each week in Africa a con roll should be made for those who have been injured, with those who have drunk stagnant water requiring a hard one, and failure resulting in a range of sicknesses though it does suggest that it takes them out for a few days rather than killing them. It then gives us a page of notable Nairobi locations, which includes where each notable NPC can usually be found, and then we move on to the first line of inquiry, the Nairobi Star. The investigators at some point will be approached by Tabansi, a newspaper vendor selling the Nairobi Star. He will wax lyrical on how Mrs Smythe Forbes is a fine lady and hard worker, and those that read the paper will see that the train attack is accurately reported. If they approach Mrs Smythe Forbes in a delicate fashion, she will confess that she believes that supernatural forces are at work. She can either be a powerful enemy or a great ally, depending on how this is done. Tarn Kaur will be watching the investigators. If she sees that they go to the star officers, she will launch another fiery assault, this time on the newspaper. Her preferred option is to attack with fire vampires about 11 minutes after the investigators enter the building. This could accelerate their investigations into the location of the Mountain of the Black Wind. It then moves on to what the Nairobi Star Files show. They can find out details on the Carlisle expedition, along with their stay at Hampton House, with one particular picture showing Hypatia Masters looking rather dumpy, maybe pregnant. They can find information on the discovery of the bodies, and it also includes comments by Mrs Smythe Forbes, alongside the various other contacts that the investigators can track down. After this, it shifts to the contacts that they could have from Jackson Elias' notes. First up, it covers Hampton House, where they can speak to Reggie Baines. He can recount that he enjoyed hosting them and remembers that they had a lot of contact with Asian and black African individuals. He also helps Sir Aubrey arrange shipments to London to the Penkew Foundation and will also mention the hunting lodge of Colonel Endicott. After this it covers Neville German. German firmly believes that the expedition was massacred by a cult, but not the one the investigators are pursuing. He thinks it was that of the White Gorilla. He will talk of how his father, Sir Wade German, discovered this lost city in the 18th century in the Congo. The city is actually real, and Neville has maps leading to it. Investigators can actually completely sidetrack and head off to discover the city. The names of the cult of the bloody tongue, the Black Pharaoh and Mueru are meaningless to him. His home contains many African artefacts, and he actually owns a mythos artefact, an ebony carving of a hunting horror that will allow the user to bind one without knowing the spell. The next contact is Dr Horace Starrett. He assisted the expedition in purchasing medical supplies in return for Hypatia Masters volunteering to work with the church. He'll remember the expedition staying with Colonel Endicott. He was distressed to hear about the massacre and was one of the people who examined the bodies. He will confess that they were, without exception, torn to shreds and strangely fresh considering how long they had lain on the ground. Additionally, he found no Caucasian remains amongst the dead, something the authorities insisted he leave out. It also mentions that he could replace a party member if required. Next, it details San Mariga. He can be found at his house at the train depot, with his humble shack having lush and brilliant plant growth. Mariga was the person who discovered the carnage of the massacre and reported it to the authorities. Should the players breach the supernatural, he will direct them to Johnston Kenyatta. As a side note, Mariga can guide the investigators all the way to the Mountain of the Black Wind, should they ingratiate themselves with him. It then moves on to Roger Corydon, the Colonial Undersecretary for Internal Affairs at Government House, who is a genial and useful person. He was the overseer of the investigation into the massacre, who will just shrug, saying that some Nandi tribes were hanged and that doubtless others escaped who should be punished. He's intrigued with the matter though, and remember Jackson Elias. Those with the right skills can determine that he's not being entirely honest, and the truth of the matter is that he was told by his superiors to maintain the lie. 
There's also Montgomery and Pumption, who are part of the King's African Rifles. He can be charmed by pretty ladies into giving his full cooperation. He will remember Erica Carlyle causing a fuss, which led to search parties being sent out, and will reveal that the only man in Kenya of his that witnessed the massacre is Sergeant Bumption, and will summon him if needed. He will tell the investigators what he saw, saying he saw evidence of Carlyle, Sir Aubrey and Masters dead, and that he believes a secret cult is responsible. This is, of course, Bumption simply being a good soldier. It details meetings with Nails Nelson, who will, if they buy him a drink, tell investigators that he saw Brass Brady in Hong Kong in 1923 in the Yellow Lily Bar on Wan Shing Street. It then goes on to the meeting with Johnston Kenyatta. If spoken about in the more elite white Nairobi circles, Kenyatta will be referred to in an uncomplimentary manner, being called a charlatan and a witch doctor, repeatedly talking about his magical connections. He spends most of his time at the Kikuyu Central Association or KCA and is happy to engage with the investigators. If they mention anything Mythos related or Jackson Elias, he will ask for a private meeting. He will listen to what they have to say and suggest that they meet with old Bundari. If they agree, he disappears for a few minutes and then comes back and tells them to follow a friend who is waiting outside, telling them to stop if he stops and wait to enter the door he enters, the one painted yellow. A very tall black man in a white shirt will be waiting for them outside. He will smile at them then walk off, with Kenyatta motioning for them to follow him. He will lead them to Swahili Town to meet Okomu and Old Bundari. Okay, that concludes part one of the Kenya chapter. Part two will be the conclusion of the chapter.